The village of Horningham is small, very small in fact, with a population of 358 according to the 2011 census, located eight miles west of the city of Norwich. It is not the kind of place you would expect a shooting to have taken place, but it did, at the now long gone Honningham Hall. The hall itself had been around since the early 1600s. Construction began in 1605, commissioned by Sir Thomas Richardson, a man with an illustrious political career. He would hold positions as a politician, the Speaker of the House of Commons, and the Chief Justice of the King's Bench. After his death in 1635, it would be passed down through his family and other short-term owners, until it became owned by Richard Bailey in 1650, President of St John's College in Oxford, and at one point Vice President of the whole university, whose family would own the hall until 1763, when it became home to William Townsend, the MP for Great Yarmouth, who would hold both the hall and his seat until his death in 1738. After the Townsend family, it would pass through both the first and second Barons Aylwin of the Fellows family before being placed up for sale in 1935. This is where our story begins, and, unfortunately, our unsuspecting victim comes in, Sir Eric Teichman, a British diplomat who, with his retirement approaching, brought the place to settle down in and live out the rest of his life. Teichman is one of these interesting characters who work for the diplomatic service that just don't seem to exist anymore. He was born on the 16th of January, 1884. I've been unable to discover where, but both of his brothers were born in Kent, so possibly he was as well. He was educated in Gonvol and Keys College in Cambridge, where he studied what was known at the time as Oriental Studies. Although officially a diplomat, he seems to be best described as an explorer come secret agent, who carried out several fact-finding missions and more classified work through the British government throughout Central Asia, even before the First World War. Throughout the 1930s and 1940s, he was stationed in Chongqing, southwest China, as a diplomat in the British Embassy. Their work was probably most focused on the Japanese advance into the country, starting with Manchuria in 1932 and China fully in 1937. His position would mean he was far away from the dangers of the Second World War in Europe and largely of those in the Far East as well. But despite the distance and his occupation, this would not stop him being called on to help in the war effort. As the owner of the large and mostly empty hall in Norfolk, he was contacted by the children's charity Bernardo's in 1940, who asked for use of the hall to house homeless and orphaned children. Teichman agreed and turned over the whole hall, other than one section that would remain private for him, his wife, Lady Ellen, their cook and a few servants. By the end of 1943, Eric Teichman had reached the end of his working life. After decades in service to his country halfway around the world, his retirement had arrived. He would begin the long and rather slow journey back to Britain and his home in Norfolk. He journeyed from Chongqing up to Lazo in northwest China, where he journeyed on the old Outer Silk Road that had once been the main trading route from China into Europe, across the Timar Basin, by pony and by foot, to the Pimar Mountains near modern-day Afghanistan, to Gilgit and what is today Pakistan, and then down to Delhi, from where he would make his final trip back to Britain, arriving in late 1944. The country he arrived in would be very different from the last time he saw it. Blackouts, rationing, years of bombing, now added to by the V1 and V2 rockets, had taken their toll on many. And of course, the almost countless number of American servicemen now stationed in the country, including just down the road from Horningham Hall. This influx of US forces had a huge effect both on the local area and the country as a whole both positive and negative. I'm planning to go into more detail on this on a later date, but locally these events were known as the Friendly Invasion. It was Sunday, the 3rd of December, 1944. Across the Channel in Europe, the Western Allies were closing in on the borders of Germany, although their enemy had seemingly gained a new will to fight the closer they got to home soil. With the US attack into the Hergen Forest, repulsed with heavy casualties, earning it the nickname the Meat Grinder. Germany was not prepared to just fight on the defensive either and were finalising the plans for Operation Watch on the Rhine, the offensive into the Ardennes that would come to be known as the Battle of the Bulge. All while to their east, the seemingly unstoppable steamroller of the Red Army drew ever closer, capturing the Hungarian city of Mislok on this day. In the Pacific, the area of the war that would have had most of Sir Eric's attention while at work, US island hopping campaign towards Japan was gaining steam with the US Marines recently capturing the island of Peleliu, while in another part of the Pacific, 
the army were fighting their way through the Philippines. In short, the war was going in the Allies' favour. With the third also marking the date, the Home Guard was officially stood down by the British government. But not all were enjoying their time in uniform. Two of these friendly invaders, Private George E. Smith and Private Leonard S. V. Patcher, a quick aside here, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce this person's name. I've looked through and I can find no pronunciations anywhere, so this is the one I'm going with. I apologise if it's wrong. Members of the 784th Bomber Squadron of the United States Army Air Force, stationed at RAF Attlebridge nearby, were struck with one of the biggest adversaries of anyone spending time in the military, extreme boredom. Both men came from large cities, Smith from Pittsburgh and V. Patcher from Detroit, so we can only imagine how they must have felt being sent to rural Norfolk. They seem to have found little to do in the depths of winter other than sit around and drink beer. Together, they went to the base's armoury and took a pair of M1 carbines, under the guise of going hunting. I have seen conflicting sources of whether they stole them, took them officially, or possibly bribed a quartermaster to get their hands on them. It may sound shocking they were able to get their hands on them so easily by today's safety standards, but it was not uncommon for the time. And although these are just anecdotes, I have heard several stories from people who were around at the time of US servicemen hunting everything from deers to owls with all manner of weapons. What they're expecting to hunt in the middle of winter is a bit of a mystery, but likely this was not the point. They just wanted to get away from the base, let off some steam and have some time to themselves. So armed and ready, they set out to do a spot of hunting, or to be honest, poaching. Leaving RAF Attlebridge, they chose their hunting ground, fatefully for all involved, the nearby Honingham Hall. Sir Eric Teichman had not been home long. Some sources claim only a few days, and had just begun to settle into his retirement, relaxing in the drawing room after lunch, when his peace and quiet were suddenly shattered as gunshots rang out near the hall. More annoyed than anything that his quiet time had been ruined, he decided to go out and put a stop to whatever was going on. I can only imagine there had been a problem with shooting on the estate in the past in Sir Eric's absence, as he is reported to have said to his wife, I'm going out to stop this damn poaching, as he stormed out of the house towards the commotion. It may seem strange to go out unarmed to confront at least one armed intruder, especially with the reputation that poachers once had, but by the 1940s, poachers were more often than not locals or board soldiers who either ran off when confronted or apologised. Unfortunately for Sir Eric, it was not going to be one of these encounters. In a wooded area nearby, Smith and V. Patcher were trying their best to hit a particularly wily squirrel that was jumping from branch to branch, avoiding their incoming fire. Now, only three people really know what happened that day, so we'll have to take the account of those who survived it as truth. The two men were behind adjacent trees, almost facing each other, when Smith saw Sir Eric marching towards them, coming from behind V-Patcher, yelling at them, Wait a minute, what are your names? For reasons known only to Smith, he took aim at the approaching stranger. Maybe the beer he had consumed at the base had got the better of him. Maybe he just intended to scare him off so he and his friend could make a break for it. Or maybe he had much darker ideas. But whatever he had meant to do is now irrelevant. He fired. Sir Eric was about six foot tall. Due to a riding injury from years before, he walked with a slight stoop. And due to this and the angle he was walking, Smith's bullet hit him in the right cheek, shattering his jaw, passing through his body, and exiting by the left shoulder blade. He collapsed on the spot and is believed to have died quickly of blood loss and shock. He was 60 years old. The two GIs had made a terrible decision, but what they were about to do now would seal their fates. Neither went to try and help the dying man, or raise any alarm of what had been done. They both ran back to their base, returned their M1s, and tried to keep a low profile. Sir Eric would lay there until after darkness fell, and his worried wife, Lady Ellen, organised a search party to find him. Due to where he had fallen and the size of the estate, some 3,000 acres, the search would take a while, and it was after midnight that his body was found, some 300 yards from the house, lying in the bracken. The police were called and the investigation began. The remnants of the bullet were also recovered, and 50 yards from where he fell, 10 empty 30 calibre casings were found, and two wads of chewing gum. It left little doubt where it had come from. The local airbase was sealed off, and military police began rounding up suspects. Smith and V. Patcher were close to the top of their list, especially Smith himself, who was far from a model soldier, and had already been court-martialed eight times since joining the army in 1942, 
but they had nothing to prove their involvement, until an anonymous airman came forward, saying he had seen the pair sneaking out of the camp with the weapons on the day of the shooting. They were arrested on the 7th of December. Smith initially confessed to the crime, but later would retract his statement, claiming it was made under duress, while V. Patcher described the scene as I told it to you before. The pair were held until the 8th of January 1945, when their court-martial began held at RAF Athelbridge. It lasted five days, due to Smith being repeatedly hospitalised. Newspapers picked up on the story and the trial, printing Smith's statement. Some of us had been drinking beer. I drank about 15 coffee cups of beer. We saw a lot of blackbirds around, and we shot some of them. We went up into the woods. I saw a squirrel and fired one clip of 15 shots. One of us said, there's an old man. I think I saw him first and made that remark. I don't remember the old man saying anything to me, nor do I remember saying anything to him. I raised my gun to my side, pointed at the old man, and fired one shot. I saw the man fall. When the trial came to an end, Smith was convicted of murder and sentenced to death. B. Patcher was convicted as an accessory to murder, but escaped the death penalty and was given a lengthy prison sentence. As more public attention was drawn to the case, more information soon came out about those involved, especially Smith and his mental state. Before the trial, he was subjected to a psychometric evaluation by Major Thomas Marsh of the US hospital that was based at Wyndham College in Norfolk, and later Major L. Alexander, a specialist of neurology and psychiatry, who, in his opinion, Smith was suffering from a continual psychopathic condition, emotion instability, and an explosive, primitive, sadistic aggressiveness. His mental deficiency was borderline. His mental age was about nine years. His condition was a mentally defective homicidal degenerate, and Smith acted almost on automatic impulse. The opinion was seconded by a civilian doctor, Dr. John Vincent Morris, of the Little Plumstead Hall Institute in Norwich, who said, Smith showed no sign of emotion or regret about the shooting. He talked about it as a man talked of killing a rabbit. And Dr. Morris believed that Smith could have shot Sir Eric for no other reason than he'd interrupted his fun. Smith was taken from Norfolk and sent south to Shepton Mallet Prison in Dorset. The prison itself had been in operation from 1625 until 1930 when it was closed. It reopened as a military prison in October 1939. Birth of British servicemen before being handed over to the Americans in mid-1942 and under the provisions of the Visiting Forces Act of 1942. This allowed them to use American military justice on British soil. While being held there, George Smith tried to appeal his conviction, but it was denied, as were the appeals of others, including Lady Teichman, the widow of Sir Eric, who appealed for clemency and the overturning of his death penalty. But his fate was sealed. The final bitter note to George Smith's life was the date his execution was carried out. The 8th of May, 1945. VE Day. The day the war in Europe came to an end. While countless millions celebrated, Smith was led from his cell to the execution shed, where the hangman awaited him. The execution was carried out by Thomas Pierpoint, the uncle of Albert Pierpoint, the most famous and last hangman in British history, assisted by a Herbert Morris. The reason why American executions were being carried out by a British hangman was due to the British view that the American style was outdated and cruel could lead to slow strangulation, rather than their method that broke the neck and caused near instant death. The US hangman who had been brought over also didn't know how to use the British style of gallows properly, so a compromise was met. The whole process would be American, but the hanging itself would be British. Smith was taken to the gallows at 1am. He wore his uniform, but all rank, unit patches and insignia had been removed, as he had been dishonourably discharged from the US Army by this time. As part of the US rules, his legs were strapped together, his hands were tied behind his back, a hood and noose were placed over his head. His death warrant and charges were read out before being asked if he had any last words. He didn't. In total, it took 22 minutes of being taken from his cell to being pronounced dead, aged 28. This was around the normal amount of time for an execution at Shepton Mallet, but far too long for the likes of Pierpoint, who saw it as an unnecessary delay that only prolonged the condemned's misery, and if he'd had his way, 22 seconds would have been more than enough to get the job done. In total, 18 Americans were executed at Shepton Mallet from mid-1942 to September 1945. 
16 by hanging and 2 by firing squad. Hanging was far more popular though, both with locals, they didn't like to be woken up by early morning gun volleys, and US authorities, who disliked shooting men they saw as common criminals, considering it a soldier's death they no longer deserved. George Smith was originally buried in the Brookwood American Cemetery until 1949, when he, along with all but one of the US servicemen executed in Britain, was taken to Plotty at the Oisain American Cemetery and Memorial in France, a private section of the cemetery away from those killed in action, and buried with others who were executed while serving in Europe, an area known as the House of Shame and them the Dishonoured Dead. They were all buried there, facing away from the main cemetery located across the road. No US flag is permitted to fly over their graves, nor do they carry their names, only numbers. George Smith can be found grave number 52 on row 3. It wouldn't be until 2009 when the identities of who was buried in which grave was released to the public. Sir Eric Teichman was laid to rest in the churchyard of St Andrew's Church in Horningham. He holds the strange honour of the most high-profile British civilian killed by Americans during the war. At one time, his grave was in line with Honingham Hall, which carried on as a Bernardo's home until December 1966 and was demolished shortly afterwards. Lady Ellen passed away in 1969 and is buried with her husband. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Please feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was the Honningham Hall shooting, and this was a little bit of history.